Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 18th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we continue the discussion we started last week of what some recent polling tells us about the upcoming governor's race. Second, we discuss a recent op-ed by the governor trying to spin the FY23 budget as a win for Alaskans. And third, we look at a legislative proposal to spend $100,000 on a, quote, friendly, close quote, lawsuit with the administration. And now, let's join Michael. Let's start things out. First things first, the primaries. More discussions, more decisions, fundraising, dollars, money. There's all kinds of functions and features here, Brad. Where do we uh, where do we get started? Well, let's start sort of where we left off uh, last week. We were talking last week about a poll that uh, uh, Alaska Research Survey had Ivan Moore's group had done, and we were sort of puzzling through the numbers and trying to figure out where uh, Charlie Pierce was and and that sort of stuff. There right. was an article. There was an article last week in the ADN that had as an attachment uh, the poll results themselves and sort of let, uh, provided some additional light uh, to what we were talking about last week and and gives a, it's an insight, I think, uh, at least I'm gaining an insight into how ranked choice voting is, uh, is going to work. Um, so the poll results showed that, uh, that, that what we were talking about last week, the Dunleavy Gara Walker results uh, were the result of the second round. Uh, uh, in, in fact, Ivan had done uh, essentially a poll of the first round and then uh, and then dropped out the the trailing candidate, the fourth candidate, uh, and consolidated that into the second round. And the numbers we saw last week were the second round. First round was the first round was interesting. It was um, according to the poll results in the first round. Uh, Dunleavy has 42.5% of the vote uh, among those who are, who are certain that they will vote right. numbers for the category of certain, uh, 42.5% of the vote, uh, Les Guerra, uh, and, uh, and his running mate, 26.7% of the vote, uh, Bill Walker, 20% of the vote, and then Charlie, uh, with 10% of the vote. Uh, which uh, was was pretty good. I mean, pretty significant for a guy that uh, doesn't have a whole lot of name recognition. And the poll results uh, for, for readers that are interested, go to the go to the ADN article and then look for the link to the to the poll results. Um, so Charlie's were pretty good for you know ten percent for uh, some guy that doesn't have a lot of name recognition statewide. And the and the poll will have information about his name recognition statewide in there. And then in the second round, Charlie drops out. Charlie's dropped out since he's the trailing. And his second uh, second uh, preference votes then are redistributed among the remaining three candidates. And Dunleavy moves from 42.5% among certain, those certain to vote to uh, uh, 50 point, let's see, it's 50 point, oh, wrong direction, 50 point, uh, well, 50 even. A little bit, a little bit over fifty percent um, uh, for uh, uh, in the second round. So what happens in ranked choice voting? Um, and 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 you know, it, I and others are starting to get our minds around this. What happens in ranked choice voting 
it, it, really the second and third candidates aren't all that important. <laughs> they they are if the if the top two candidates are running close to each other, but if you've got a situation like the poll results show that we have here, uh, with the top running can the top running candidate not yet at fifty percent but running ahead, the second and third candidates sort of splitting the vote between them. Right. And then the fourth candidate uh, uh, running behind, but 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 nevertheless in the race, the fourth candidate. Uh, then when you when you go to the second round, the fourth candidate's votes are all that are, are, are all that count. His second his second choice votes are all that count, and that's what pushes Dunleavy over the top. If 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 Walker had been close, or if Guerra had been close, maybe it goes to a third round. But because the second and third candidates are splitting the vote, uh, splitting the, the, the anti-Dunleavy or the non-Dunleavy vote between them, um, uh, Charlie sort of determines, Charlie's second, second choice vote sort of determine the election. So it's, a, it, it, it's an education that, that, you know, who's in fourth place, uh, it may not be, <laughs> may not be good for them uh, because they may not be on the way to, to winning the election. But uh, who it, the, the preferences, the second the, the second choice preferences of the candidate in fourth place may very well determine the outcome of the election. And that's what that's what the poll results uh, are showing here. So it's sort of it's it, 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 it's important who gets into fourth place. And I think I think the lesson of all this is that, interestingly enough, that I think the Dunleavy, if Dunleavy's not going to get 50 percent. Um, in the first round, what he really wants people to do is vote for Charlie. Uh, if they're not going to vote for him, he really wants them voting for Charlie because it looks like when it was Charlie in fourth place, uh, when you when, if Dunleavy doesn't get fifty percent in the first round in November, right? Then Charlie's second point, but second uh, preference votes will uh, will will push him over. Um, it, it's a it's an interesting phenomenon as you start as you start to work well, through. This, how this works. This reminds us we had a discussion with Dr. Fred Van Bennecombe here a few weeks ago talking about rank choice, and he was a rank, he's a rank choice voting expert from the Great Brook Institute, and he said in many areas where they have experimented with rank choice voting, that has become the that has become the strategy, is that a group of Republicans or a band of Republicans will run for the same or or adjacent offices in different districts. And they basically started to kind of all campaign together and say, you know, either vote for me for number one, but if you can't vote for me, at least put me number two, putting it into that number two slot and uh, basically banding together and uh, and doing that. Basically, folk, it reminds me of the old Avis ad that we're number two because we try harder, right? Uh, which was really not true. The whole marketing story behind that is that they were actually elect number seven, but it was all about perception. We're number two because we try harder, but that seemed like that seems to be the whole thing is that focusing on getting that number two vote is almost as imperative for many people as getting the number one vote uh, so they can get it through. And maybe that's Dunleavy's plan here to try and do that. I, I just I just don't know. It's going to be such a hot mess um, that I and I think people are still confused, even though I'm starting to see a few more ads now trickle through. I think people are still confused at this point. Well, and at least in the governor's race, we're going to be confused. We're going to be confused for a while because as as you pointed out, as I learned early on from listening to the Michael Duke show, uh, in in the August primary we have one vote, uh, and then in the and we don't have these these the ranked choice vote until we get in the governor's race until we get to uh, until we get to November. So, you know, it, it's it the 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 one vote even if your guy is losing, even if you know your guy isn't going to win the August primary, or your or your woman, whatever. It, right. Even if you know they're not going to win. Uh, the August primary, it's nevertheless important, significant, and and it counts to to vote for them. I mean, voting for Charlie is a vote to get him into fourth place, right? Position him, <laughs> position him. A, I think I think it will give him more name recognition. I think it will promote his candidacy uh, throughout the state to be in the in the top four, certainly. Uh, but B, it sort of positions him to play to play that role as as the uh, in fourth place to. If we go into additional rounds, if no one gets fifty percent in the first round, to, for his second second preference voters uh, to determine the outcome of the race. No, and I I think I think you're right. I think if he is able to pass the primary, Charlie in this case, 
is able to pass in uh, pass the primary and get into the general as the fourth choice, that gives him a much better platform to get a basically above the noise of all the other candidates that are out there right now running and then give people who are frustrated with uh, Governor Dunleavy's performance an alternative that maybe they didn't know. And maybe maybe those numbers change. I, I don't know. Um, but it was surprising to me that there was such a show of support, 42, what'd you say, 42% in the first round, 43% in the first round for Governor Dunleavy. That's a, that's, that shocked me quite honestly. That was a lot higher than I was expecting. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was 42 among the, the, those certain to vote. It was, uh, 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 51% among those very, very likely to vote. And, and I guess the thing that I, uh, that's, that's, that's surprising. Uh, but I guess the thing that's even more surprising to me is this split between Walker and Guerra. Um, it, you know, and with Guerra in the first round, at least having more vote than, uh, than Walker, 26% of those certain to vote versus right. 20 per, per, 20% for Walker. And I, and I really, you know, I thought Walker would do a lot stronger, uh, in, um, uh, in the first round. And I thought he'd be, I, I thought, uh, just, you know, thinking about it, I thought it would be Dunleavy, Walker, Guerra far b- uh, behind Walker significantly. And then Charlie in fourth. Um, with the potential that, you know, Walker held Dunleavy down enough that, that, that the fourth, when you doing the fourth round, doing the fourth place votes, redistributing them didn't get Dunleavy over 50%. And so you then kicked into the third place votes or the third finisher votes. And, um, and I thought that would be a race uh, where the race would be between Walker and, uh, and Dunleavy. But now, you know, looking at the poll results, at least, uh, Walker and Guerra are just splitting that vote almost right down the middle between the two of them, the non-Dunleavy vote between the two of them, and uh, and essentially knocking each other out. Um, I think we're past, well, maybe we're not past the withdrawal date, but I, but I, but I, but we're moving uh, uh, farther down the road, and I don't think Les is going to be uh, inclined to, uh, to drop out. So if these, if these trends hold, I see where you know where the the story last week talked about you know Dunleavy being far ahead and 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 moving into uh, 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 almost an unbeatable position. I see where those numbers are coming from. They could yeah could happen. Surprising to me that uh, Guerra was garnering about thirty uh, percent more of that vote than uh, Walker was at twenty six to twenty something like that. So right. it's a pretty significant amount when it's all said and done. And as you said, a, I'm sorry. It, there's a lot of Southeast vote. I mean, what's, what's going on with less is there's a lot of Southeast vote for less, yeah. for less, a lot of traditional Democrat uh, uh, vote for less. Well, that's really where. And of course, part of these campaigns has to do with money. And it was reported late last night, early this morning that uh, there was a lot of campaign reports that came out. And of course, yesterday was all about the monies from the various candidates. And uh, Bill Walker had uh, quite a, a 30 day reporting quarter there uh, for himself, but it may not be from who you expect. I know you wanted to hit on this as part of number one. I do. Uh, so Jeff Landfield uh, was going through the 30-day reports. We'll see all sorts of pre- all sorts of press reports today about the uh, 30-day reports. These are the reports that the candidate statewide candidates file or state candidates file uh, 30 days in advance of the election. Um, and Landfield had a uh, had a, a piece up uh, uh, on Facebook last night that he looked at Walker's report. Walker had eight hundred and some odd thousand dollars uh, uh, contributed to his campaign. Three hundred thousand of that uh, came from in in three individual uh, hundred thousand dollar donations. Uh, two of them uh, were from people who had been behind and pushed and, and are pushing the rank choice voting um, uh, approach. Catherine Murdoch uh, from New York and uh, Greg Orman from Kansas. Uh, uh, were two of the three hundred thousand dollar contributors. Kathy and Murdoch. Then, uh, Kathy Murdoch, by the way, was the lady that said Alaska is a cheap date. That was uh, that was her famous comment on the rank choice voting thing. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, and and she and 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 Orman uh, both were uh, have been big advocates of, uh, of of rank choice voting and of independent candidates generally. Greg ran for Senate in Kansas, if I recall, I think it was Senate, uh, as an independent, did fairly well for a while, uh, spent a lot of money on it, ultimately uh, didn't win the election. But uh, but both of them have been big proponents of, of independence generally and ranked choice voting. And then the third was interesting. I've not dug into this. I'm sure 
uh, there will be uh, there will be various reports today that do. Uh, but the third was a, a guy by the name of Jason Carroll, uh, who lists his occupation as journalist and his employer as CNN. Uh, and I've not heard that name before, uh, but uh, but he was the third uh, person. So of eight of Walker's eight hundred plus thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars of it is coming from three individuals and one hundred thousand uh, dollar tranches. Now, not to be outdone. <laughs> I went. I went before the show. I went and 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 worked briefly through Dunleavy's uh, uh, contribution list, and right. he also has three. Uh, he has over a million dollars uh, uh, in uh, in donations for that he's reporting in the thirty day report. A lot of that's coming from uh, a transfer from the campaign before he named Nancy Dahlstrom as his vice as his lieutenant governor candidate, um, and so it's it's a transfer over from the previous campaign. Uh, but he has he also has three hundred thousand uh, dollar donors. One of them is his brother, Francis Dunleavy. Right. Uh, uh, one hundred and sixty some odd thousand dollars, if I recall correctly, from just glancing through it. Bob Penny, <laughs> uh, uh, our friend Bob Penny from down in the Kenai, um, uh, also one hundred thousand uh, dollars contributing. And then a guy who I who I've done a quick search on and really don't know that much about. This is sort of like the third one from the Walker campaign, but a guy by the name of Armand Brockman, who is a uh, apparently an apartment and real estate developer from from Minnesota, uh, also has given $100,000 uh, to Dunleavy. I'm sure we'll see uh, more uh, digging into that uh, as uh, as the as the in the days ahead by uh, by the press. But, you know, Walker, what, what, Landfield had the had was out of the gate first with talking about uh, Walker's hundred thousand dollar donors, but uh, uh, Dunleavy's uh, not that far behind. Uh, Dunleavy also has, and again, I'm sure we'll see more analysis of this in the days ahead. But Dunleavy also has a significant contingent of money coming from Houston. Um, frankly, some of the from the some of the oil and gas lawyers that I used to uh, used to practice with in the old days. So um, there's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of outside money that's uh, that, that's coming into this. Race. And just a quick reminder, Bob Penny, by the way, was the guy that had the no bid contract with the state. As well, I mean, just want to throw that out there to remind people. He, uh, he, his his son, Clark Penny. His son. No I'm bid. sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. His son, not him. His son. What was that contract for, Brad? I've forgotten. It was a consulting contract with the administration as a special advisor to the governor, wasn't it? I for for economic development. Economic re- development. Yeah, if I recall correctly. Um, and uh, he was supposed to turn up leads for a, for investments in Alaska or something like that. Um, the, the reaction from the chat room. Wait, what? Outside money trying to determine a race? Shocking, I tell you. <gasps> gasp. Get, like, gasp. Uh, shocking. Dark money? <laughs> wow. Well, at least it's not at least it's not dark money. <laughs> at least we know. Yeah, we know. We know where it's coming from. It's just a lot of money. I mean, yeah. So three three eighths, uh, whatever that is, a twenty—that's quite a bit. About forty percent um, of uh, of Walker's money is coming from three individuals, uh, out of state individuals. And you right. know, I as I say, uh, y- you can count Bob Penny as in state money uh, uh, for for Dunleavy, but Francis's money. Francis, li- his brother, lives in Houston, and and Bachman lives in uh, uh, in Minnesota. So. Plus, you know, you got all this Houston money that's coming in. So there's gonna there's a lot of outside money. It's disclosed, so it's not dark at least. But there's right, a right. lot, a lot of outside money that's uh, that's coming into the state. I took a glance at Les's um, uh, donations and at Charlie's donations. Um, there's no hundred thousand dollar donors for uh, for either. I didn't see any for Les, but there's no hundred thousand dollars donors for Charlie. I went through his. Uh, uh, fairly completely uh, last night. So it's, um, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing money attracted to the candidates. And even with that, I guess it's notable, even with that Walker is still, you know, in third place in the initial voting, according right. to, uh, according to, uh, uh, according to the poll. So, right. Well, and again, interesting, uh, Charlie with the lowest name recognition of the bunch and probably competing at $25 intervals instead of hundred thousand dollar intervals, as far as donations go, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's everything that I can do to try and just get Charlie's name out there for people because we need that other choice. I, again, I was I was literally shocked when I saw that reporting that uh, Dunleavy had garnered 42% of that vote. Uh, and I'm glad you were able to dig in and get the, the figure out that that was actually round two because I was just like, what happened? It's good to know that Charlie does have at least enough name recognition, it seems, to trump the rest of the uh, of the pack, so to speak. Uh, but let's hope that maybe between August the 16th and November, uh, Charlie can make enough headway to eke and eat a little bit into Dunleavy's um, lead, giving them a, you know, giving them an, a second option anyway, at least. You know, you know, Michael, we need to think about this uh, because, again, what the poll tells us is who finishes in fourth for somebody where somebody's way out in front, who, who finishes in fourth is important. So. You know, there, there's, I am sure there's a scenario where you want, this is horrible to say, but where you want Charlie in fourth, you want his second preference votes to be the ones that determine the outcome of the race. If right. Charlie would sneak ahead of Les, for example, or sneak ahead of Walker, and then it's Walker's votes or Les's votes that determine the outcome uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the ultimate, uh, in, 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 you know, ra- in round two. That's not the outcome, not the outcome you would want. So this is the, the, the strategy and the tactics behind all of this is just uh, sort of mind boggling. So, for example, I mean, just to put some concreteness. So, for example, let's say less takes off and let's say less gets close to Dunleavy. Um, and, and it's the two of them uh, that are one and two in the in the in, in, after after the after the first round's done. Right. Charlie, Charlie comes up, uh, overtakes a, a Walker, and Walker drops to fourth. So then in round two, it's Walker's second preference votes that are distributed instead of Charlie's. Right, which are more likely to favor less than anybody else at that point. So, it, yeah, you're right. It is interesting in that regard because if, if Charlie does become third, then whoever he beats at this point, it would be Walker would be the next lowest. Then Walker's number twos would go to presumably Guerra. Potentially, if it was twenty and twenty six, that puts him at forty six. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it 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 that would lead maybe to a fourth round. So it's yeah, this whole thing is it's so <laughs> complex. It's so I mean, it's so convoluted. And of course, you know, making the recount nearly impossible because it's all with these various ballots and it's got to be done by computer, which ever, you know, nobody trusts that anymore. It seems like everybody's got some questions about it. It definitely um, leads to a lot of questions. It, it is a super complex um, situation. It is. And I'm not, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure at the end of the day if this is going to express the will of the people uh, or not, because you've got a situation. In which the fourth, I mean, at least looking at the poll that Ivan did and the results from the poll, you've got a situation in which the fourth round, sec- or the, the fourth place, second preference votes are going to determine uh, the outcome of the election. The, 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 the second finisher and the third finisher's second preference votes aren't, aren't going to have any, have any impact. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, we're up against the break, Brad. Quick, brief peek at number two. got to go here. Well, number two is uh, an opinion piece that Dunleavy had in the uh, uh, in the ADN, claiming victory on uh, on the budget uh, that uh, the budget was a, was a win for Alaskans. Uh, we talked about the budget a lot last week, uh, but this uh, this piece has some things that uh, I want to delve into uh, uh, to to talk about it again. Getting to number two, which of course is the governor's spin on the fiscal year twenty three budget. I read this piece, Brad, and. Um... I I just don't even know what to think at this point. I mean, I just don't. How do you you know? How do you how do you polish a turd? Um, I, apparently, according to MythBusters, it can be done, and uh, Dunleavy is attempting it here. Uh, I don't know if he does as good a job as MythBusters, but uh, what say you? Well, the headline of the article this is a this is an op ed piece uh, written by the governor or whoever writes for the governor these days. Uh, opinion: State's 2023 budget represents bipartisan wins. For Alaskans, I, I get it. I get it. It is campaign season, uh, and uh, and and the incumbent governor wants to say that you know what he's doing is a good job, and he's and he's pushing forward for Alaskans, and and uh, and and you know it, as part of his campaign to be reelected, I'm doing it now, and and reelect me so I can continue to do it. I get all that, 
but but he's celebrating he is celebrating a a, a budget that is that is not a victory for uh uh, for uh, for for many, it's a victory for those who like government spending. It's a victory for the top twenty percent who want to finance that government spending by uh, by PFD cuts. Uh, but it's not a victory for uh, for either those uh, you know middle and lower income Alaska families who would who would benefit from PFDs, or a victory for those who believe in smaller government, more limited uh, more limited government. Um, what the governor does is sort of cherry pick. They're, they're, you got to keep in mind that this last session really did two budgets at once. They redid the FY22 budget by adding a bunch of supplemental spending. And then they did the FY23 budget. And when you look at, at when you look at the two budgets combined, there's not good news on the PFD front. The, the FY22 budget use it has has something like 1.8 billion dollars in PFD cuts the biggest PFD cut uh in 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 the last uh, in the history of the state uh but the biggest PFD cut since uh since 2026 or 2016 by far the biggest PFD cut we had supplemental money we had additional FY22 money but we didn't use it for that we didn't use it to help supplement the PF the FY22 PFD we left that PFD cut in place and used the supplemental money for additional spending, additional capital spending to, to pay off past uh, uh, school bond debt reimbursement that the state had, uh, had cut uh, to pay off the, to, to fund the oil and gas tax credit fund, which, had, which, was, uh, which was running low to pay it off uh, uh, not only in the past, but, but going forward. Uh, we did it for additional capital spending. But we didn't use any of it to to help supplement uh, supplement what was the largest PFD cut in the state history. Um, the FY twenty three budget looks better from the from the PFD standpoint because you've got uh, a PFD plus you've got uh, the envir- the the energy uh, uh, rebate the energy relief. But when you consolidate the FY twenty two and the FY twenty three PFDs, you still have a huge PFD cut. You still have uh, it'd be near the largest in the state's history if you just average it out between between the the two years, uh, and also in FY twenty three you've got you know additional spending on the capital budget and additional spending on on statewide spending and and you know you've got the 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 the, uh, the set aside for uh, for K through twelve the the forward funding for K through twelve, um, so you've got when you look at these two budgets together, you have a disaster. You have a disaster from the standpoint of the PFD, and you have a disaster from the standpoint of increased spending, diverting money from, from PFD cuts over to increased spending. What the governor's piece does is he cherry picks, right? He talks a lot about the PFD portion of the FY23 budget uh, and you know, claims success on the PFD uh, with, respect, with respect to you know, what was done with the, with the FY23 portion. He talks a lot about savings, which is coming from the FY22 portion. Um, so he, he really, he sort of weaves in and out, uh, talking about, you know, one, one year alone when it suits his purpose, talking about the two years combined when it suits his purpose, and claiming victory out of that. It's, it, it is, it is a, obviously, it's a campaign piece. It is, it is trying to create the impression that this budget resulted in uh, in a in a strong bipartisan result, as he put it, but the but the the truth of the matter is, when you look at those two budgets combined, when you look at at the at the legislative session and what it did to FY22 and FY23 combined, um, it is it is huge spending uh, uh, financed uh, on the backs largely of middle and lower income Alaska families through huge PFD cuts. Yeah, I mean, I had to say that the one the one paragraph in this whole thing that just made me think. This is what not what you want your base and the people that elected you to read, Mike Dunleavy, when he said, we're rebuilding our savings account that were nearly drained when I took office. Based on current projections, we were able to put $1.7 billion into the constitutional budget reserve, use the additional surplus to fund K-12 for the fiscal year. To, that's, a, that's a billion dollars, by the way. And put more than $340 million into the higher education fund. Combined with the royalty back payments to the CBR, we're saving about $3.6 billion. Now, wait, you said you were going to give us a full PFD. And although earlier in the argument in the, in the budget or in the article, you tell us, 
oh, well, this is the largest PFD in history. It's not a full PFD, and yet you're bragging about putting away $3.6 billion, but we don't have any money to pay a, pay a full PFD. I mean, th- this is just complete and total. This is not real logic, I guess, is what I'm saying. But it's logic that, you know, according to Ivan's poll, is getting him 40 plus percent in the first round. Well, that's true. And, I guess. And 50% in the second round. I mean, yeah. So, so what's going on here is they have a bunch of facts from the, from, you know, the, the budgets, the FY22 and the FY23 budgets as, as they got, as they got finished in the session. And then someone's gone through, it's like a game of 52 pickup, right? Somebody's like, gone through and picked. I like that one. I like that one. I like exactly. that one. I like that one. I don't like that one. Don't, don't pick that one up. Pick this one up. <laughs> exactly right. And then you're writing an article, then you're writing an op-ed out of the cards, out of the cards that you pick. So yeah. it's a, uh, it, it, it's a campaign piece. It's a campaign piece geared to, oh, I hate I hate this term, but it's true. Low information voters who are who are getting most of their uh, most of their knowledge from uh, from from reading the the ADN, the op ed, and the articles in the ADN, um, and you know, and and the the most important part of it to to Dunleavy is to you know the part that says victory, success, bipartisan success. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying he has a big banner behind him that says mission accomplished, right? I mean, that's the whole thing. Uh, we got about two minutes here, Brad. Uh, final things on number two, and I guess we'll do number three over the break unless you want to hold on into the next hour. No, let's do it. Let's do it over the break. Um, well, final things on number two is is don't don't watch the words. Look at what actually happened in, in the budget. We've had analysis up on our page on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Facebook page or on our website uh, that goes through the F, the F, looks at the FY22 and FY23 budgets, looks at the at the at the PFD cuts, and and really analyzes this budget. One concerning thing, and I'll leave with this. One concerning thing: if but if if Dunleavy thinks this budget is a success, God only knows what that means for the second term. Uh, yeah, no. Talk about what would a failure look like at this point? What would a disaster look like at this point? It's uh, it is insane. Um, well, Brad, thank you for your analysis on this. I I don't even know what the next four years looks like. I really don't. I can't even. I would hate to even put money out at this point. Uh, we really need to get we really need to get some more name recognition for Charlie Pierce on this and work hard between uh, now and uh, November. I think. Yeah, I'm just thinking, how could you read or write this paragraph with a straight face and be like, I'm your hero, let me beat my chest, look at me, I am the full PFD warrior, pay no attention to the fact that I put $3.6 billion away, and that you, you pitiful peasants, got exa- you got the highest, why are you complaining, you got the highest you've ever asked for, we did it for you, oh my god, this guy is just killing me, killing me. Yeah, and buying into, I mean, buying into the argument that th- this is the highest ever, looking at the absolute amount as opposed to the right. you know, per- percent of what it should have been or right. a- a- anything of that sort, uh, is just sort of buying into the same philosophy that, that's that been used the last five years of we'll just set the PFD on a whim. You know, we'll set we'll set it on we'll set it by number as opposed to looking at what the right what the statute says. Well, people and forget it, people forget this is only like sixty percent of a full PFD, because if you take the energy rebate out, it's what twenty five hundred bucks, and they say a full PFD by the average should be about forty two hundred forty three hundred. So you're getting about sixty percent of a full PFD. I mean, it's it it it's crazy. Even include even include the energy rebate, Michael. And add it to, and 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 then and then combine it with FY twenty two. What we've got, including the energy rebate, what we've got is about a about about a fifty percent of the statutory PFD. Those two years combined. The 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 important deal out of this session is to is to keep looking at what they did with FY twenty two, and FY twenty three combined. Right. And when you and when you because they had money, they had the money to 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 pay off the FY twenty two PFD. When you combine those two, what they essentially did was pay a 50% of statutory, not a 50-50, but a 50% of statutory uh, uh, PFD combined uh, over those two years. And, and you know, and it, and it, and and to claim, you know, and to, and to cherry pick and say, well, let's just look at FY23. We did good out on FY23. Well, what they did, I mean, looking at those two years combined, what they did is really load the money into FY23. Right. 
so they can say, look, look at the FY23 PFD. Isn't it, isn't it big? Isn't it a, isn't it a, isn't it a great thing? Leaving the FY22 $1.8 billion or $1.7 billion PFD cut in place um, and not addressing that at all, uh, but loading it all into FY23 so you get a talking point out of FY23. All right, Brad, number three, we got about four <laughs> minutes here. Uh, number three, uh, which is this friendly, quote unquote, lawsuit that the legislature decided to throw 100000 bucks at. Give it to me. So we've been having a dispute, goes back to the Walker administration between the legislative auditor who, who audits the state's books uh, on an annual basis and the administration, starting with the Walker administration, about what to do with about $1.5 billion, if I recall, in refunds that came to the state out of a, out of a previous uh, uh, TAPS uh, uh, pipeline case. Uh, TAPS was ordered to refund a bunch of money to the state uh, or to refund a bunch of money to producers that then flowed through to the state uh, in terms of taxes. And the question was whether that goes to the CBR <coughs> excuse me, whether that money goes to the CBR or it goes to the general fund. Uh, if it was, if it's treated as a refund of, of prior taxes due, it goes to the CBR. The constitution says it goes to the CBR. If it's treated as current revenue, essentially, it goes to the general fund. And the administrations, Walker administration, the Dunleavy administration, have argued that it should be treated as current revenue and go to the general fund the legislature believes it, it goes to uh, it should go to the CBR. Frankly, at the end of the day, it doesn't make that much of a difference about about where you account for it. Uh, but nevertheless, the two have battled on and on about it. And this has been going on for several years, as I say, stretching back to the Walker administration. So what the legislature did, uh, what the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee did uh, this past week was say, we need to resolve this. And the way we're going to resolve it is file a friendly lawsuit in the courts uh, against the administration uh, to ask the, the ultimately the Supreme Court, first the district court and then the, the Supreme Court to resolve where this money uh, should go. And to fund this lawsuit, to pay for this lawsuit, we're going to authorize $100,000 for private lawyers uh, to go fight about this, you know, billion to a billion and a half uh, uh, determination. In the past, th this says two things about the state. One, in the past, this would have been resolved by an attorney general's opinion. Uh, this state, uh, at least up until the Walker administration, um, <clears throat> uh, relied on attorney general's opinions as sort of the, the equivalent of Supreme Court opinions. You can find a lot of decisions that have been made by the legislature or decisions that may have been made elsewhere uh, that are relying on attorney general's opinions. Basically, this says we don't trust, basically what the legislature is saying is we don't trust the attorney general anymore, and now we've got to engage the courts and to engage the courts, we're willing to pay $100,000. $100,000, as a former lawyer, that's even to me, that's a lot. $100,000 to fight a lawsuit, a friendly lawsuit with the administration over how to allocate this. It should be resolved by the attorney general. We should rely on attorney general's opinions and move on. But for some reason, the legislature, and and uh, and, and this is Natasha as chairman of the LBNA, uh, the legislature and the administration keep on fighting about this and 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 now want to spend $100,000 in state money, bleed it out into private lawyers' hands uh, to fight about it in the courts. I think that's just I think that's just a wrong a wrong headed decision. Where, I mean, do you have an opinion quickly here on where you think the money should be? I mean, the CBR, since it's owed a bunch of money, I think would probably be the logical place. But what do you say? Oh, I think it ought to be in the CBR. I mean, I've I fought these these pipeline battles over the years, and I think this is I think this should be treated as a refund. But again, it, it's not really that big a deal. Certainly not a a, a big enough deal to spend a hundred thousand dollars trying to resolve it when you've got an attorney general who can give an opinion that that resolves it instead. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Uh, we will uh, we'll see you next week with more exciting news. Michael, as always, thanks for having. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.